My name is Nari Sol, I'm a pianist composer, and in this video, we're going to dive into the genius of Eric Satie's Junopedi number no. one. I've gathered three characteristics that I love about this piece that show how Satie was centuries ahead of his time. And I wanna show you why I think this piece is a lot more complex and difficult to play than a lot of people assume. This episode is sponsored by Tom Play, who is providing the interactive sheet music that I'll be using throughout the video. I'm going to first go over an analysis section, then we'll present to you a fully annotated performance of the piece, followed by a special postlude that I wrote that accentuates some of the more jazzy and pianistic elements of the original. The three characteristics that I'm about to mention all highlight Satie's unique approach to composition, how he uses traditional building blocks of music, but in very unconventional ways. Ways that to me are very elegantly weird. The first thing that I wanna mention about the piece is that the rhythm is actually not so easy to play. The piece is monorhythmic in nature and hardly has any variation other than this figure and straight quarter notes there on after. In order for this piece to really shine, you have to play it in a very poised and peaceful manner. And in order to do this, you have to have a lot of control at the piano. Even though the melody is quite lyrical, you can't approach it in a very expressive and overly romantic way. Also, in order to achieve a very weightless and tender sound, you have to be careful with the chords. You have to make sure they're not played unevenly or with any kind of strain. Speaking of chords, let's move on to point number two. A tonal center is never truly confirmed. The piece starts off with two chords, G major seven and D major seven. Going back and forth in a way that isn't really clear, are we in G major or D major? And even though the melody points towards D major, we never really have a cadence that confirms it. So have a listen to what it would sound like if there was a clear cadence here. It really takes away from the peaceful quality of it. We then have a turnaround into E minor. And then we have meandering chords over a D pedal. And at this point, we're really not sure what key we're in. Satie so shifts between sections that are based around major and minor keys and modes like Dorian and Phrygian, all while keeping the hierarchy of the notes and harmony ambiguous. Now let's talk a little bit about his use of chords. The use of seventh chords in a very colorful, slightly non-functional way is quite similar to jazz and a lot of contemporary music out there. And that's why I was inspired to lean into the jazzier elements of this piece for my postlude, which you'll hear later on. The next point is a bit more abstract and subjective, but I think it is very significant. And that is that the piece is not ambitious in any way. What I mean by this is that the piece isn't really trying to be anything. It doesn't have much purpose, no direction, and it's not serious like a lot of pieces written in the classical music sphere. The piece was written in 1888, and just to give you some context, here are some pieces that were also written in the 1880s. Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, Franck's Violin Sonata, and Symphony No. 3 by Saint-Saëns. Satie's Gymnopédie No. 1 is very different from these pieces. It's meditative, reflective, less formal, and also almost boring if you try to evaluate it as a performance piece. Now let's do a quick experiment. So just imagine... This actually sounds like something that could be written today, but really Satie didn't go down this route. He kept it... very sparse. And that's in line with his concept of furniture music, which is basically the first form of background music to ever be invented. Satie saw the value of music that is not deliberately listened to and paid attention to, and I quite like this idea. In fact, it's one of my life goals to create background music for my dogs. <laughs> I think it's kind of a shame that in certain circles back then and even now, Satie's music is dismissed because 
it lacks form, it doesn't have virtuosity, and it lacks gravitas. But I obviously disagree with this. The piece actually demands quite a bit from the pianist, in my opinion. So now I'm going to move on to a performance of the piece with a fully annotated score provided by Tom Play, the sponsors of this video. So a quick word about them first. Tomplay is an interactive sheet music database that guides you through the process of learning a piece with all kinds of tools such as a built-in playback of the score, meaning you can point to any part of the sheet music and hear what it actually sounds like. You can also add your own notations to the score, adjust the tempo, turn on a metronome, loop a particular section, and if you're more of a visual learner, you can refer to the instrument models, which really come in handy. So if you look here, you can see which keys need to be pressed on the keyboard as you go. You can even record yourself to monitor your own progress. One of my favorite things about Tomplay is how you can use it to learn pieces that have ensemble parts, so songs with accompaniment and even piano concertos. So a huge thank you to Tomplay for sponsoring this video and now on to the performance.
I hope you enjoyed the music and the video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you so much to Tomplay again for sponsoring this video. Thank you to my patrons for your continued support. And if you haven't subscribed already to this channel, make sure you do so so that I get to see you in the next video.